to Luke 418 Radio. You're listening to The Dove. I am your host, Kenneth Ramsby. I would like to welcome each and every one of you. I hope your life is enhanced by the word of God we share here on The Dove. Come with me as we receive inspiration to our hearts for life. Hello, Dove Show listeners. To begin today's show, I would like to read from the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 11. And the word of God reads, To which end we also pray always for you, that our God may count you worthy of your calling, and fulfill every desire of goodness and every work of faith with power. May the Lord add a blessing. To the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father in heaven, the great I am, we thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. Now I ask, Lord, for a greater anointing and a greater grace to be placed upon us. Send your Holy Spirit to fill us, to guide our minds, our will, our intellect, our emotions, and our body each day. Let us serve you as tools in your hand. Open your spiritual heart, Lord, to open our spiritual eyes and ears now so we can hear your word. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, from the top of our heads to the soles of our feet. Give us strength to have faith unwavering no matter what may come our way. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Today's show is titled, Sermon on the Mount, Part 2. Today, we're again going to take a look at one of the most profound and transformative teachings of Jesus Christ, the Sermon on the Mount. Last week, we looked at Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. Today, we'll take a look and I will share with you the episodes, and this episode, Matthew 5, 13 through 48 course. Again, these verses are where Jesus imparts timeless wisdom and offers a blueprint for us living a blessed life and fulfilling life. As we explore this holy text, let us open our hearts and minds to the overwhelming truths that are contained within them. At the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, As we went over, Jesus shares a series of blessings that reveal the counterintuitive nature of God's kingdom versus all the things of the world. In Matthew 5, 13 through 22, we discussed all these things that Jesus has said. And as we continue, we see that Jesus goes on to provide examples of how he interprets and expands upon the commandments and the laws that were made and given to the Israelites. He takes the commandment against murder in our section today and explains that not only the act of murder, but also harboring anger and insulting others can lead to judgment. Jesus is emphasizing the importance of inner attitudes and the control of our emotions, teaching us that it's not just the physical act of murder that matters, but also the thoughts and words that come from a person's heart. Oh, yeah. The first verse in this part of our series in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 reads this. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Many of us have heard this verse over the years and did not fully understand it. You see, in this verse, Jesus uses the metaphor of salt to describe the role of us as his followers in the world. Salt adds flavor and preserves food. And similarly, we as Christians are called to bring goodness, wisdom, and a moral influence upon the world. 
However, if we as Christians lose our moral character and integrity, we become ineffective. Just as tasteless salt is worthless, we become worthless to the kingdom of God. As we continue looking, let's take a look at verse 6, 14 through 16. This is another familiar verse and reads, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Now, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. Here we see Jesus using another metaphor of light to stress the importance of living a righteous and moral life. Christians are called to be a positive influence on the world. Just as a city on a hill cannot be hidden, and a lamp should not be hidden, but should illuminate its surroundings. The good deeds of believers should be visible to others, leading people to recognize their presence of God in their lives. Living a righteous and moral life includes the things that separate us from the world, not being part of the world. You know, things like celebrating Halloween as it is a satanic high holiday and no making up. Just let the kids have fun and get candy as there's no reason, you know, that ain't no reason to partake in the cup of the devil. I'm going to tell you, you just people make up all kinds of excuses to do what they want to do. First Corinthians 10, 20 through 21 says this. And think about it. You Halloween goers. No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. So if Halloween is a satanic holiday, you should have no parts in it as a servant of Jesus Christ. No parts. That's what the word says. You can't, you can't drink a cup of demons and a cup of the Lord. You can't do it. We are warned against participating, period, in activities with idolatry, false gods, and certainly the devil. You can dress it up any way you like, but the bottom line is it is a celebration of satanic high holiday. That's what Halloween is, where vile acts of sacrifice happen to animals and humans. And like they used to say in the old Western show, you know, the guns of Will Sonnet back in the 60s. No brag, just fact. We must separate ourselves from all vile pagan holidays, not just this one. We must be the light to the world that is different. Are you different? Or are you just falling in with everybody else? Oh, it's just for the kids to get candies. Oh, we just dress up, you know, as Superman and Batman. And, and then we go just have fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Satan laughing right now at you. You call yourself a Christian, but you're partying with pagans. Mm -hmm. As we go one verse Deeper, verses 17 through 20 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For I truly tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. 
all my friends, oh, you got to do better than them Pharisees and Sadducees back in Jesus' day to get in. So says the Lord. Jesus clarifies here his relationship with the Jewish law, you know, the law of Moses and the laws that the prophets put out. He asserts that he has come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. This means that he embodies the ultimate purpose and fulfillment of the law and the prophetic teachings. Jesus emphasizes the enduring importance of God's commands. Jesus states that not even the smallest part of the law will disappear until everything is accomplished. Jesus also challenges his followers to surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, emphasizing the importance of eternal righteousness and not just outward observance of rules. How many times or how many people in your church do you know who fit this bill? I tell you, I have known a few over time. You know, those that go to church on Sunday and in the club on Wednesdays doing happy hour and then back in the club on Friday and Saturday, then back in the church on Sunday, dressed up in a three-piece suit, clean as a whistle, singing louder than the choir, carrying the biggest Bible you've ever seen, praising the Lord as loud as they can, making sure everyone can hear them, and thinking that they have it going on with the Holy Spirit. They just putting up a facade. Yeah, that same person who was just sinning a few hours ago, he's up in church <laughs> hauling and hooping. Look, the devil will make you think it is okay to sin as long as you go to church on Sunday and ask forgiveness as while you are sitting there making all that noise in church, the devil is right there with many people edging them on with words like, you know, the devil will say this to you now. Yeah, God will forgive me each time I sin. He put thoughts in your head. And, you know, thoughts that I will be with the Lord when I die as my sins are covered from the past, current, and future. So no matter what I do, I'm good to go. I am good to go. You know, words like this and thoughts like this, like, you know, my sins are, are covered now, the ones I did back in the day, anything I do right now that's covered, and anything I do in the future is covered, so I ain't even got to repent, and I ain't even got to try to stop sinning. I can just go do whatever I ought to do. I'm covered. I'm covered in the blood. You done heard them say it. They skipping over God's truth for words that when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for every sin that you and I and the rest of the human race ever committed. From Adam's first sin until the very last sin that will be committed on this planet. But that does not mean that God forgives our sins before we commit them. You sitting up there thinking the sins that you can do, and then you're going out and doing them. And you think God just saying, yeah, that's okay, I got him covered. Every time you sin, come on, you got to realize the truth. We must repent and turn away from sinning. What is wrong with people these days? They think that they can just sin and God think it's okay for you to sin because you said a prayer 10 years ago. Now you can just go out and do whatever you want to do. I, I beg to differ because if you repent and say that you stop sinning, you don't know the definition of repentance. Repentance means that you turn it away from your wicked sins. Look up the definition. Let the Holy Spirit lead you in all things. And if you're out there sinning, you ain't got the Holy Spirit leading you. That's for sure. Because the Holy Spirit will warn you when you go off track. Oh, yeah, for sure. Jesus talks about anger here in verses 21 through 22 of Matthew 5 and says this. You have heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, 
Anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. You know, we are all just human. And before we fully understand how grieving it is to get angry, we may have all done it one time or another. You know, we only just human. All of us have done it one time or another. You know, this passage from the Sermon on the Mount conveys the importance of living life that reflects the teachings of Jesus, not only in the actions, but also in our attitudes and character, how we look at people, how we treat people, calling them names. You know, and it also talks about and, and gets us, guides us in respecting and upholding the moral principles of the law and what the prophet said in the Old Testament. As we move on in Matthew 5, verses 23 through 26, on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he addresses the importance of reconciliation and resolving conflicts within the community of believers. Now, in verse 23, Jesus begins by saying this, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother and your sister has something against you. Here, Jesus emphasizes the importance of interpersonal relationship within the context of worship. He suggests that if anyone is about to present an offering or gift to God at the altar, but they remember that they have unresolved issues or conflicts with a fellow believer, they should first seek reconciliation with that person. So before you go up there to make your offering to God and you got something holding against somebody and it's unreconciled, you need to fix that first before you make an offering. They'll so say as verse 23 of Matthew chapter 5. In verse 24, Jesus advises, he says this, leave your gift there in the front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with them, then come and offer your gift. Jesus tells us that reconciliation and resolving conflicts should take precedence over religious rituals. Jesus encourages individuals to prioritize making amends and restoring our relationship before engaging in acts of worship or offering any sacrifices to God. So says the word. So if you got a problem and you have an unreconciled difference with a person, don't be going up in church making sacrifices and making offerings and thinking that's going to do something for you. Don't do it. Fix it first. We always got to remember that the Lord think is more important on our relationship with him and our relationship with other people and loving others as that is the one of the first things in the law. And the first thing that Jesus said is a priority is loving the God with all your heart and your, heart, your mind and your soul and loving others as yourself, putting others before you, not making sacrifices and offerings. That's not the priority. Of course, we have to do it, but it ain't the number one, so says the Lord. Verse 25 continues and says, Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown in prison. In this verse, Jesus extends the principle of reconciliation to legal matters as well. He advises believers to resolve legal disputes or conflicts with others as quickly as possible. And doing this even before reaching the courtroom to avoid more severe consequences. We should try to settle things out of court first. Verse 26 says, I truly tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Here, Jesus emphasizes the seriousness of unresolved conflicts and their potential to lead to long lasting consequences. Jesus' teachings in these verses highlight the importance of forgiveness, 
reconciliation, and peacemaking as fundamental principles for individuals and their relationship with one another and with God. In Matthew 5, verses 27 through 30, in verse 27, Jesus says this as we go through 27 through 30. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Jesus goes beyond the act of physical adultery and delves into the matter of lust in verse 28. And he states this, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Here, Jesus highlights the significance of purity, not just in actions, but also in one's thoughts and intentions. We must keep in mind and understand that thoughts are part of judgment by God as everything we do is recorded by God. Everything. In Matthew 5, verses 29 through 30, Jesus uses a vivid metaphorical language to stress the seriousness of sinful actions and thought. And he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Although this may be a metaphorical verse, these verses emphasize that we must be willing to take radical measures to avoid sin and temptation. You know, that sin and lust of the eyes and lust of the flesh. Yeah, yeah. You better close them eyes. You better take them out. You ain't got to physically take them out, but you better shut them and put something in front of them. You can't have, you can't be lusting, talking about, it's okay, I'm just looking. And all the while, your mind is churning up some sin and think that's okay. In Matthew 5, verses 31 through 32, Jesus clarifies marriage as a sacred and binding contract. Here, Jesus emphasizes the seriousness of divorce, suggesting that divorcing a spouse without valid grounds such as sexual immorality leads to adultery. He also warns against marrying someone who has been wrongfully divorced, as this also con constitutes uh, devo you know, adultery. As we continue to hear Jesus' guidance for us from his Sermon on the Mount, we see in chapter 5, verses 33 through 37, as in this passage, Jesus begins saying this. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. Jesus goes on to teach a higher standard in truthfulness and integrity, expanding on the Old Testament law. Jesus goes on to say, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Here, Jesus emphasizing that we, as his disciples, should not need to make elaborate oaths and vows to validate their words. Instead, our everyday speech should be characterized by honesty and reliability and that our yes be yes and our no be no. Jesus concludes by saying, let what you say simply yes or no. Just say yes or no. Anything more than that comes from evil. Mm -hmm. You've heard people, you ask them a question, you ask them a simple yes or no question, and they go rattling off on everything else except yes or no. Jesus stresses the importance of straightforward and truthful communication, suggesting that elaborate oath can be signed 
uh, can be a sign of insincerity or lack of integrity. Too much talking can drum up lies. And I'm going to tell you right now, I saw it all. I see it all the time on the news. Someone will ask a person a question about a simple question. Do you support this or do you support that? And they won't say yes or no. You know, like, do you like orange soda? They won't say yes or no. They'll say, well, orange soda is something that everybody likes and all people, you know, can drink it. But they'll never say, yes, I like it or no, I don't like it. They will go on with some elaborate thing, yakking their mouth about nothing and never giving you a clear answer. I guess politicians is the ones that mostly do that, of course. <laughs> That's for sure. They will give you a straight answer. <laughs> they go all around the bush most of the time, I tell you. Matthew 5, through 37 teaches that Jesus' disciples it teaches us the importance of honesty and integrity in our speech. We are encouraged to let our eyes be yes, let our yes be yes and our no's to be no, avoiding the elaborate oaths and vows that validate our words. We need to answer everything we do when we say in truth and straightforward. Verses 38 through 42 of Matthew chapter 5 is where Jesus delivers teachings of ethical guidelines to his followers. In these verses, Jesus addresses the principle of retaliation and encourages his disciples to respond to injustice with love, forgiveness, and non-resistance. Oh, here we go, my friends. Verse 38, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said in I-49 or two four two. However, Jesus introduces a new perspective in verse 39. He goes on to say, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Here, Jesus is advocating for a radical departure from the idea of seeking revenge. He advises his followers to respond to an insult or Injury with humility and non-resistance. Think Martin Luther King, if you will. In verse 40, he continues on and says, If anyone would sue you, take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Jesus suggests that instead of fighting legal battles or holding on material possessions, his followers should be willing to give generously even when it seems unfair. (laughs) Can <laughs> let me ask you this. Are you willing to give someone something when you know they have cheated you out of it? I'm just asking. In verse 41, Jesus goes on and says, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. He encourages his followers to go above and beyond what is required, going two miles instead of one demonstrating a spirit of willing service to others. We must serve and not worry about being served. In verse 42, Jesus concludes this, give to one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. He emphasizes the importance of being generous and compassion, urging those who follow him to help those in need without hesitation, without turning them away when they ask for something. Let me ask you this. Can you say yes every time to someone when they ask you for something without blinking? Look, I have been changed to do just that, but I must be honest and say, sometimes I have blinked before being reminded by the Holy Spirit of what God's word says I should do when somebody asks me something, right? Because some people, they'll ask you stuff. If you be nice to them, like with money, they ask you to give them money or borrow money, and they don't pay you back when they say they do. And then they'll come right back and ask you for some more money. And then they'll say, I'll pay you back. And then you're like, oh, he ain't paid back the first time. And then they, they'll say, I'll pay you back. And then they'll come and ask you again the third time for money and they ain't paid you back for the first two times. What would you do? I'm going to tell you what I do. 
<laughs> I have loose hands. The Bible said we should have loose hands. This is material stuff on this earth. Especially if your family, your family, you know, they know that you following God and you got a good heart. And sometimes they will want to take advantage of you. And, you know, every time you know that they take advantage of you, you got to pray for them. You know, you got to pray for them. But if you know they in need and they keep coming to you because you're the only one that's going to give them some money out of the whole family. Go on and give it to them. And don't worry about them giving it back. And then remind them, look, you don't have to tell them. Don't tell me that you're going to pay me back and you know that you're not. Don't do that. Just ask me to give it to you and I give it to you. That's what I say. You know, I just let it go. So I don't want them to lie to me and they're trying to get money. But then they'll say, oh, I'm going to pay you back. I will pay you back. And then they don't. Again, for the fourth time. I tell you, it's amazing. You know, even if you tell them, don't worry about it, they still going to say, I'll pay you back. No, they ain't going to pay you back. It ain't got the means to. It's just a sad thing. I just got to give them the money because God going to take care of me. Oh, yeah, he, he he's good like that. Oh, yeah. Now, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48, Jesus emphasizes the love of our enemies. In these verses, Jesus is delivering the Sermon on the Mount, the significant teaching moment in Christian tradition. He begins by saying, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, he is referring to a common interpretation of the Old Testament, right? However, Jesus goes on to challenge this conventional wisdom and presents a radical new perspective on love and righteousness. He instructs his followers to love not only their neighbors, but also their enemies. And he says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Just like I would just said with that money. People that you know, they cheat you out of everything and they keep coming back to you to cheat you out some more. Don't worry about them. Let God dispel justice upon them. But you have the kind heart, the, 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 the loving heart to just do and follow the word of God and not worry about it. Especially when it comes to material things. You got to realize this stuff is, you know, this stuff was going to rust and be gone in, in a moment of time. But the things that you do and the way that you treat people will last forever. Love never goes away like the love that God has for us. You know, Jesus emphasizes that loving those who love you is not extraordinary. You know, you love somebody because they love you. You know, he says that even tax collectors and pagans do that. So instead, he calls for the followers of him, his followers, the followers of Jesus Christ to have a higher standard of love and compassion. He explains that by loving our enemies and praying for those who mistreat us, we imitate God's perfect love, which extends to all, both good and bad. Jesus concludes in verse 48 by saying, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Here, perfect doesn't mean flawless in every way, but rather signifies a completeness in love and moral character. Jesus encourages us to aspire to a love that transcends boundaries and prejudices just as God love does. Are you prejudiced? Are you black and hate white people? Are you white and hate black people? Are you Hispanic and hate Chinese people? Huh? Are you? God says you got to love everybody. You got to be above all of that things that you see and you hear in the world and all the little idiosyncrasies that people have about other people. You don't worry about that. You just following God's word in perfection, being flawless in every way. You know, we all are, no one is perfect, you know, but we got to show love and a moral character that is above, above everybody. Like God said, it transcends boundaries and prejudices. Now, Matthew 5, 43 through 48 teaches the importance of our unconditional love and forgiveness and compassion towards everybody. And I mean everybody. God said everybody. 
Now, you can think of people that you got a problem with, right? You need to work on fixing that. Ask the Holy Spirit to change your heart and your mind to transform you into follow, being a follower, a true follower of Jesus Christ, to think like Jesus Christ, to love like Jesus Christ, to treat your fellow man as Jesus Christ treats you. Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 through 48 as we went over these last two weeks is Jesus telling us that we got to be a light for others to follow. Jesus tells us that he came to fulfill the law, teaching us that evil, you know, evil stuff like murder begins in our hearts and we must guard our hearts. That adultery is not just physical, but mental as well. It can cause us to die in that sin. And that marriage is sacred and binding and that oaths should be forbidden. You forbid oaths. So all y'all out there doing oaths and these sororities and this and that, <laughs> Jesus say, let your yes be yes and your no be no and don't make no oaths. Now, you can take that any way you want to. It ain't my words. They his. We should only say yes and no and not swear to oaths. Now, when we a kid, our parents, you know, us that grew up in the church and the Christians, and, and, and our parents would tell us, don't be swearing. You know, you don't swear. You say, I swear to God. You know, people say that. Oh, forgive me, Lord, for even saying that as an example. But people say that, and God say, don't say it. Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. And if you got a problem with that, you need to talk to God about it. That's for sure. We got to go to a second man with our fellow man and give others, you know, things no matter what when they ask for it. To love our enemy as ourselves, to bless those who curse us, to do good to those who hate us and pray for those who use us and trust in the Lord to distribute, here you go, justice in our behalf. That's what we do. We trust in the Lord. Because see, I'm going to tell you, the Lord's justice is something else, my friends. Oh, you can't distribute justice like the Lord can distribute it. You let the Lord distribute justice on your behalf. We got to let the love of God's word tell us how to live by them, to be kept in our hearts, depending on the Holy Spirit as our comforter, to steer us in the right direction, to guide us through the small gate, to lead us down that narrow road that leads to heaven everlasting for us all. Look, in the verses we went over, Jesus teaches us a profound lesson in Matthew 5, verses 1 through 48. He teaches us about responding to injustice and mistreatment, and that we do the opposite. We respond to it with love, forgiveness, and selflessness. He challenges us to follow him and embody a higher standard of behavior. We got to follow Jesus and embody a higher standard of behavior that reflects the love and grace of God. These verses in Matthew 5 highlights Jesus' teachings on the sanctity of marriage and importance of one marital commitments that emphasizes and emphasizes that need to know that the faithfulness and avoidance of diverse divorce, except in case of sexual immorality with the ultimate goal of preserving the sacred bond of marriage. Oh, the Sermon on the Mount, my friend. It is not just a mere collection of moral principles. It's a call to live a transformed life by faith, love, and grace. It challenges us, that Sermon on the Mount, oh, to be humble, merciful, and forgiving, embodying the character of Christ in our daily interactions. As we internalize these teachings and allow them to shape our lives, we will experience the blessedness that comes from living in harmony with God's kingdom. You got to be in harmony with God's kingdom. You're always worried about what you'll say or what you learn, what you say. You just worry about what God's words say. Life is so easy when you just look at the word of God and live by the word of God. It's easy. You get all the other stuff in this world is all mess and garbage anyway. Let us strive to be the salt and light of the world, separating ourselves. 
from the worldly things. Separate ourselves from this world. We live on the world, but we ain't got to be of it. That's for sure. We have to live reflecting the love and grace of our Savior Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. If you haven't given your life to Christ yet, why don't you do it today? God is waiting to shower you with his righteousness and blessings for your life. Oh, my friends, you will not be disappointed. God loves each and every one of you, and so do I. And I don't want anyone to be off track and be driven down the road of, 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 of sin and, have, and leave their chance for eternal life. Lose your chance to go to heaven. You know, out here messing around in the world, don't be caught short at the end. Please don't come now. You don't know when the end going to happen. Turn your life around now. Ask God to transform your heart, your mind, and your will in all that you do and to fill you from the top of your head to the sole of your feet with the Holy Spirit to guide everything, to guide your mind. Be different. Separate yourself from the world. Change from the things that you know God says don't do. Change it today. You got to do it. Ask God to help you, guide you, lead you. I want to thank each and every one of you for listening to The Dove Show. It has been truly a pleasure to go over Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 48. And next week, we will continue on with the Sermon of the Mount. Join me again, my friends, next week as we continue to share God's word and learn how to live our life according to the word of Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you and your family. You've been listening to The Dove on Luke 418 Radio. Join us next week as we share God's word. Download the Luke 418 Radio app from your app store. Be sure to tune in daily to Luke418Radio.com. Be sure to share the podcast on your favorite social media channel. 